ICC UAE makes it possible. Jeffrey Bloom, a maritime specialist arbitrator and expert witness. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, just getting right to it. Can you tell us in layman's terms what happened with the Ever Given? How this happened? And how could a ship block the maritime plumbing, the world's largest maritime artery, maybe carrying 12% of global trade? Jeff. Hi, Vinny. It's really good to see you and also KP. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this major ICC event in Dubai. I would really like to be there with you all. I do miss my visit to the UAE. So to come back to your question, first of all, let's remember that this was a very recent event. Just two weeks ago, on the 23rd of March, the Ever Given was traveling through the Suez Canal when she was hit by a sandstorm. The strong winds in that open area coming at a speed of 40 knots, which is approximately 75 kilometers per hour, were pushing hard against a high wall of containers. The wall of containers was like an enormous sail catching the wind, and then it became difficult to steer the ship. We're not yet sure, but either just before or just after the strong wind pushed the ship to one side, there was also a blackout of the ship's entire electric system, which prevented steering. There is going to be the mother of investigation, so we don't know all the facts just yet. The hull deviated, went off track, and the ship then ran aground at the 151 kilometer mark at the southern end of the Suez Canal, just after she'd entered coming in from the Red Sea, going north. And then she turned sideways, and she was stuck blocking the canal oh. both ways. The crew, consisting entirely of Indian nationals, are thankfully all okay, and none of them has injuries. That's really but good. I've heard that they might very soon be arrested. Arrested? Well, uh, Jeff, you, you should really uh, uh, produce movies. You are a great storyteller. Uh, by way of background and perspective, can you tell us, the audience, about the voyage of the Ever Given? Uh, where was it um, sailing from and to? Okay, well, first of all, ships are always she, never oh, in. Okay. When the vessel was en route to Rotterdam from China, she's carrying 20,000 shipping containers of cargo. If each container were laid end to end, they would stretch for nearly 126 kilometers with goods inside valued at maybe 9 billion US dollars. Unsurprisingly, the ship is massive inside. She's over 400 meters or 1,000 feet long. So trying to move her is like, like, like trying to move the Empire State Building or half the Burj Khalifa. Half the Burj Khalifa. Sounds almost uh, impossible, Jeff. Uh, that is certainly fascinating, Jeff. So in light of uh, recent news, can you give our audience the real inside track and how they eventually freed the Ever Given from this sandbank, as you say? Well, Vin, sandbanks are not like any other bank. There's no money, no letters of credit, no ICC rules will apply. The sheer size of the ship made it a very complex and lengthy process. In a nutshell, fuel and many, many tons of ballast water were removed from the ship to help to lighten her as the salvers attempted to dig the ship's bow out using heavy machinery in order to help to refloat the ship. Unfortunately, these efforts, which are often effective, did not free this huge ship. And then the operation quickly turned international, with reinforcements arriving, including giant tugboats from Italy and from Holland. Then came an offer made by a United States Navy assessment team of dredging experts to assist in efforts to release the ship. There was talk of removing many of the containers which are on deck, onto the shore, or onto large floating pontoons with floating cranes. But that would have been a very lengthy and even more costly project. I know from a similar incident which occurred 15 years ago off the coast of Devon, South England, with a container ship half the size of the Ever Given, that removing the deck cargo that way took five weeks. Meanwhile, dredgers, and I'm sure you've seen some of the amazing photos, continued to work to dislodge and ship huge quantities of sand in an effort to help free the stranded ship. The bulbous bow of the ship was literally stuck in the sand. Be careful what you see on the internet, by the way. The ship is truly huge, but some of the pictures are clearly photoshopped to the uninitiated, to the, to the less knowing eye. Anyway, all in all, more than a dozen tugboats were used to conduct pulling maneuvers from three directions to try to dislodge the ship. 
when the vessel was partially reflated, the moon was really the biggest help. Mm -hmm. A really high tide, which of course is the, the moon acts as a magnet for our time. So the yeah. high tide assisted the dredges and tugs, and after some initial success early last Monday, she was fully freed by the end of the day. Traffic through the crucial waterway resumed on Monday evening after grueling days of intense salvage effort. It was a great demonstration of international cooperation to get that ship moving. Incredible story, Jeff, and uh, Mother Nature or the world again. The moon was a major factor here. Uh, I never heard that. I would never have dreamed about it. Uh, so incredible, Jeff. But getting into more detail, if I may, can you explain to us the significance of the Suez Canal in international trade and shipping? Why the freeing efforts carried so much urgency and attention at that time? Right, well, as you could imagine, the Suez Canal is extremely busy. Some experts said it's the channel for 10% of global trade, but my records indicate that in reality, 12% of the world's shipping traffic and a large chunk of its oil supply goes through this man-made canal. It's worth remembering that this was man-made a long time ago. The Suez Canal was opened in 1869 with very basic equipment. It was widened by the Egyptian army engineers in 2016 to allow bigger ships to pass each other rather than having to sail in convoys northbound and southbound through the narrow channel and only able to pass each other in the wide Great Bitter Lake, which is about two thirds of the way south in the Suez Canal. However, really big ships like the Ever Given and similar sized dry bulkers and tankers, which are called Suez Max for obvious reasons, need to be steered very carefully and slowly through the canal because of their length and their width, which we call beam, just like your smile, Vin, a beaming <laughs> smile, and the vessel's depth underwater, which we call draft, similar to the word for wind blowing through a small gap. These really big ships are actually too big to pass each other, except in the Great Bitter Lake. One of the other problems was her speed when entering the canal at El Suez, which is the name given to the anglicized version of the Why was no powerful tug assigned to help pull her through the canal? The Suez also became mission critical following pandemic related disruptions to shipping. And more than 50 ships usually pass through the Suez every single day. And it's estimated that around 30% of the world's shipping container volume including consumer goods that we all use every day, like electronics, televisions, laptop computers, clothes, shoes, furniture, and food, navigate the Suez Canal every day. Please do not forget the importance of empty containers. Some of those empties will have been on board the ship as well. Even the empty containers, which were caught up in the backlog, are significant because they're needed just in time. We have a concept in transport known as JIT, mm -hmm. just in time. Mm -hmm. and they are needed by Asian factories to ship goods from China and from India and from the Philippines and other Asian goods, certainly Korea, Japan, of course. From what I've read, the value of the goods delayed each day is around $400 million. And every day it took to clear the obstruction disrupted an additional $9 billion US dollars or so of goods. The cost to Egypt must be significant, perhaps more than $10 million US dollars per day, and Egypt is not a hugely wealthy country. The Suez Canal provides by far the biggest income to Egypt. Its second main source of income is tourism, which hasn't existed for over a year because of the COVID-19 travel restrictions. Wow. So the Suez Canal is the major source of income right now for Egypt. One other aspect regarding empty containers, Finn. Yeah. Chinese manufacturers of containers are making and selling thousands of new containers right now mm -hmm. to try to remove the backlog of unavailable boxes, as we call them. And there's another aspect, demurrage, which is the cost of delay to ships and containers in ports. That is rising exponentially. Last week, I attended a webinar with the head of the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission, and he confirmed that the cost of these delays in the USA alone will total squillions of US dollars. Oh, and of no. course, the rest of the world is yeah. even bigger than, than just the US market, yeah. obviously. The knock-on effect in legal and insurance claims is enormous. 
Underwriters and lawyers and expert witnesses and arbitrators like me will be busy with this for months, if not years. Uh, Jeff, you, you, honestly, you are a mine of information. Can, can you tell me about the implications of the situation had on maritime trade and on, on, on the global economy? My dear friend Vinny, as a marine man, please never ever use the word mine. We don't like the word stranded, but the word mine is even worse in the context of shipping. But to come back to your serious point, the blockage had a severe impact on businesses across the world. And over 300 ships were said to have been left waiting at various points along the canal's trajectory and also at each entry in the Red Sea and Mediterranean yep. since the canal became blocked. Yep. Some ship owners instructed their captains to change course and to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. This is going to be adding about two weeks of time and, and daily hire and extra fuel costs, along with safety risks, which are also related to piracy off the west and east coasts of Africa. Also, just look at the oil prices, which have swung wildly as traders try to weigh the impact of the blockage of a key trade transit point, the main artery, if you call it thing. The shipping rates for oil product tankers also nearly doubled after the ship became stranded. And the disruption of global supply chains threatened costly delays for companies already dealing with the challenges that came with the COVID-19 restriction. Okay, okay, well, moving on and trying to find some good news. Now that the ship has been freed, is the disruption of shipping lines fully resolved and the dangerous implications on global trade uh, safely avoided, or at least avoided for now? Well, we can envisage that the second quarter of this year might be more disruptive than the first three months and perhaps even more challenging than it was at the end of last year for the maritime industry. And obviously, shipping is a service industry, so we're serving trade and traders and obviously people who are funding them, such as the members of the ICC and the bankers yes. and so on. And this is hard to believe that it's going to be even worse in this second quarter, starting right now until the end of June. But I suspect it is true. Even a short disruption at the Suez Canal always has a domino effect for several months along the supply chain. Well, Jeff, you, uh, this incident and you now, you've undoubtedly highlighted how the global economy is so dependent on shipping lines and logistics. Are disruptions on the scale rare and is it unlikely to happen again? I would say never, ever, never. I would say, don't say never again or never, ever given. <laughs> anyway, the, the vessel's predicament is highly unusual. However, it does happen, obviously. And it's rare for a ship to be stuck in the Suez Canal at all, but certainly one of this size with all those problems of the high deck cargo. But it, it does happen, you understand? Okay, I get it, Jeff. Okay, uh, okay. Getting back on track, though, what are some of the current issues now, now unfolding day to day for traders and the shipping lines? Well, I understand that you'll be discussing these with KP as well yeah. in a moment. But for a start, let's look at some of these main issues. Clearly for ICC members, banks, letters of credit, bills of lading, hugely important documents, as we all know. They've been issued for cargo stuck for days. Will they therefore become stale documents? Mm -hmm. Not just on this evergreen ship, but the domino effect on ships, as I explained, on other ah. ships and other cargo. Okay. Also letter of credit issues, documents presented to banks, with banks even being aware of the unfolding crisis, but nevertheless, late is late. What about all those perishable goods, the, that food stuff that's on board in refrigerated containers, for example? Market values, delayed arrival of goods, knock-on effect, knock-on effect into Europe. Let's just take for what, this one ship alone, and there'll be many, many more involved as we've already discussed just now. This ship is bound for Rotterdam. That is the hub port of Central Europe. It's the biggest port in Europe. That means that there'll be lots of feeder services from Rotterdam when the containers are going to be transshipped onto smaller feeder ships going to other European ports, including the UK and Ireland and other countries in Europe. But also, let's not forget the huge market of transshipping goods on, uh, like containers onto barges, Rhine barges, that mm -hmm. then go all the way up the Rhine to Central Europe, places like yep. Switzerland. Yep. And then the knock-on effect with that and lorries and trains going from Basel and Switzerland through to Austria and Hungary. This is going to be really massive. And they're going to be insurance claims. The underwriters are going to have a field day with it. The P&I clubs as well. Legal aspects of causation, whether it's proximate causation or remote causation, will it therefore be allowed or not as a claim? Force majeure or perhaps not force majeure. 
This was definitely not a natural disaster. The high wind was not exceptional in that part of Egypt, but the combination of high wind hitting very high deck cargo, approximately 33 meters, that's 100 feet high, plus human negligence, allegedly, plus the lack of steering, will be the basis of most of these claims. We also need to think about the risk disputes and the transfer of risk disputes and delivery or lack of del timely delivery. The list goes on, but I'm gonna leave the nitty gritty to you, Vin, and also to my friend and colleague, KP. Well, um, our, 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 we've been a minute or two over, in fact, three, but, uh, but Jeffrey, it's been a wonderful, insightful story. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Blum, uh, you have really given and ever given so much information. Thank you from ICC UAE, from all our participants and viewers. Thank you, Jeffrey. You're very welcome, Vin. It's been my great pleasure to be with you, with KP and the Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers and with all our ICC colleagues. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye. ICC UAE makes it possible.